but you're also kind of talking there about this kind of conversation after the war of kind of the dependencies that are playing into it, the kind of change in attitudes that is going and kind of the patriotic duty, right? Of like the dead is the highest achievement that you can get and mm -hmm. wounded is sort of like, well, wh who, who are you now that mm -hmm. the war is slowly coming to an end? And let, let's transition that over a little bit to the pension aspect because one of the, again, these kind of paradox, I love these in history when you kind of get to this moment where it's like, we're, we're wanting to create this pension or we want to keep you on the payroll in the uh, Veterans Reserve Corps because we don't want you to be dependent mm -hmm. out there, but we're creating a dependence in you on the government because right. we're paying you money, either in pension or on payroll, but we don't want you to be dependent on others to survive. So yeah. how mentally do you justify we're creating dependence to not create dependence? Yeah, I mean, this created decades of heartburn. For the for the government, <laughs> right, yeah. um, and and huge conflicts that um, you know many of which I didn't even delve into. I mean, um, uh, oh now his name is escaping me. Um, wrote the fantastic book on um, on the pension system after the war. Oh, I, now I can't think of it. But he's he writes about the um, the the former soldier who goes on to be the, the head of the pension bureau for a short period, who is a, I believe a double amputee, mm -hmm. um, James Tanner there we go. is the name of the, 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 the guy who heads up the pension bureau for a while. Um, and that book is all about the huge conflicts mm -hmm. between the government and the pension bureau and the GAR over how pensions should work and how big the, the, you know, pension system should be and how should we pay pe all of these things, right? It's incredibly controversial, but you're absolutely right to, you know, this is a, it creates a paradox because we have, we have to do something for the soldiers. The, the right. government agrees on that in 1862. We have to provide something. Mm -hmm. They've done this duty as a citizen soldier for their government, for their, their country, and we owe them something and if we don't give them something, they will potentially go out and become beggars and paupers. And that's just going to look bad, right? We can't have the victors of the union panhandling. They do anyway, of course, but you know, we have to have some kind of safety net. At the same time, as that safety net inevitably grows and grows and grows and grows, that starts to also give them problems because it's almost like it's kind of going out of their control, right? It's including more and more and more people. It becomes the single greatest expenditure of the U.S. government by the end of the 19th century, I think. I mean, it's, it's massive. Yeah. And they're, all, they're very afraid that they're creating the very problem that they set out to avoid, mm -hmm. right? That's, they're very preoccupied with that. And they can't take away pensions completely. They can't mm -hmm. blow up the system, right? right? So what they start to do is to try to make the pension process as complex and as you know, meticulous as possible mm -hmm. so that it's not just handing them out. We have this impression that the pension bureau swelled because they were handouts. They were simply just giving soldiers money, right? Mm -hmm. But that's really not the case. The hoops that these men had to jump through, as we indicated before, to prove their disabilities mm -hmm. is very difficult. I mean, there, there's a lot of steps they have to go through. There's a lot of paperwork. Um, you know, this is why many veterans end up hiring pension attorneys to do this stuff for them, right? It's very, very complicated. Um, and then, of course, you also see just sort of like rhetorical debates in newspapers over um, our pensions actually ruining our veterans. There's a really interesting debate, fairly small scale, but really interesting about are Confederate veterans actually more masculine than Union veterans because they're not getting federal pensions, right? Which is not really Great true. They're getting state, yeah, they're getting state pensions, but you know, this is kind of an oversimplified sort of political argument that people are making in newspapers. But I thought that was really fascinating that they're saying mm -hmm. the Confederates are actually 
doing this better because they're not helping their veterans at all. Right? 